Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lauren Harrington and it is my privilege to be the host of today's webinar. Joining me are two experienced spectroscopists who would like to give you the perfect foundation for getting started in spectroscopy. But real quick, before I hand the floor over to them, I'd like to make a couple of short announcements. First, a quick refresher on using Zoom webinar. If you take a look at the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see a few different buttons. There's the chat box where we've all been introducing ourselves, and there's the uh, CC or show captions button, which allows you to enable or disable Zoom's automatic closed captioning. And then there is also a special button labeled Q&A. If you click on that Q&A button, you will have the option to submit questions for our instructors. You can submit as many questions as you would like at any point during the presentation. Don't worry, it's not going to interrupt the speaker. Today's show will be split into a couple of different parts, and we will be taking a few questions in between each part. Then at the end, we have an extended Q&A blocked out where we'll try to answer as many of the remaining questions as possible. So again, feel free to submit as many questions as you'd like, and we will do our best to get you the answers. Now, I would also like to mention that registration has now opened for next month's free webinar. This one is scheduled for April 13th and will feature Professor Paula Scotti taking a close look at the different types of cataclysmic variables. You can learn more and also find the registration link on our website at aavso.org slash webinars. I hope to see you there. Now, I would like to thank our 2024 series sponsor, Voice Astro. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. I would also like to thank this webinar's sponsor, RSpec Astro. They have a message for you. Spectroscopy with a DSLR or telescope is much easier and far less expensive than you might think. Their RSpec software for capturing and processing spectra is used by thousands of amateur and professional astronomers. RSpec Astro offers a free 30-day software trial as well as tutorial videos. They also sell star analyzer gratings and provide excellent free support. This month, they are offering a 10% discount to AAVSO members. Use their website's contact form if you have any questions. RSpec Astro is happy to help. Okay. Now, I would like to introduce our two expert instructors. Bob Buckheim will be a familiar face to many of you. He spent his daytime career as an aerospace engineer and program manager, while in the evenings he has served as the Secretary of the Orange County Astronomers, the President of the Society for Astronomical Sciences, and a valued member of the board here at the AAVSO. He has published papers on engineering management, asteroid light curves, double stars, and other astronomical topics. He has also published multiple books, including The Sky is Your Laboratory and Astronomical discoveries you can make too. On top of all of that, he's an active spectroscopist and spends most clear nights out in his observatory taking data. Bob is very well versed in how to produce quality scientific results, and we are fortunate to have him here with us today to discuss scientific spectroscopy. Joining Bob today is Scott Dunnell. Scott received his bachelor's in physics and mathematics from the University of Wisconsin and his master's in astrophysics from the Pennsylvania State University. His interests include the application of scientific imaging techniques, including both photometry and spectroscopy, in understanding the physics of variable stars and gaseous nebulae. Scott is an active member of the Colorado Springs Astronomical Society, having served as president, vice president, treasurer, and trustee. And he currently serves as the co-director for the Rocky Mountain Star Stair, as well as deputy director for the CS Astro Long Range Planning Committee. You might know him from his involvement with the AAVSO, where he is the new leader of the AAVSO spectroscopy section. It's a role which he is perfectly suited for, with years of experience both doing spectroscopy himself and working to improve the AAVSO's spectroscopic educational materials. 
We're very fortunate to have an educator like Scott here with us today as well. With that, I would like to hand over the floor to Bob and Scott. Please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, Bob and I are gonna be uh, giving a presentation in three parts. I'll be doing the first part and then I'll hand over to Bob for part two. And then the two of us will go through parts three together. So um, Bob, if, did you have any opening comments before I begin? Nope, carry on, thank you. Oh, okay, um, sharing my screen. And Lauren, give me a QA check on that. Looks great. Okay, <clears throat> perfect. So uh, today, the introduction, uh, the introduction to astronomical spectroscopy for amateur astronomers. Part one, the overview. So I want to say hello, everyone. Um, I'll be starting this off. And uh, so let's start with the question, what is astronomical spectroscopy? Well, simply put, it's the process of dispersing starlight into its component colors and performing analysis of that dispersed light to determine the physical properties of astronomical objects. So you can learn a lot from a spectrum, things like the temperatures and spectral types of stars, what elements are present, the gas temperature and density of a nebula, the presence of and properties of a circumstellar disk or shell, the rotation velocities of galaxies, distances to galaxies and quasars, and much, much more. There are primarily three ways for amateur astronomers to get started in spectroscopy. <clears throat> the first is what we call slitless. This type of spectroscopy uses a spectral gradient filter to produce spectra of all the stars in the field of view, much like the objective prisms used in the early days of astronomical spectroscopy. Next is a low resolution spectrometer. This is an instrument that obtains a spectrum of a single object, but across the entire visible spectrum. Then there's the high resolution spectrometer an instrument providing a detailed spectrum over a narrow range of wavelengths. The easiest and least expensive way to get started in spectroscopy is to attach a spectroscopic grading filter to the front of a camera. So with this setup, you can produce spectra of all the stars in the camera's field of view, at least all the bright ones, in a single shot. The grading filter used is a star analyzer 100 or 200 and available through this, one of the sponsors of this, um, of this webinar at uh, rspecastro.com for about $200 or so. You can also attach an SA100 or 200 grading to your camera's filter wheel. Using software, some of which cost and others are free, you can process your spectrum and do basic analysis, such as determining which elements are present. In this example, we see a spectrum of a planetary nebula showing the presence of hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. We can also determine that the, gas ne that the nebula gas density must be very low in order for the forbidden oxygen lines to be present. So with this simple setup, we were able to gain some insight into the physical properties of this nebula. The next step of doing astronomical spectroscopy is using a spectrometer containing a slit that disperses the light from a single object. Such a device produces a spectrum with higher resolution than a grading filter, allowing you to see more detail in the spectrum. The example shown here is the LP600 spectrometer produced by Shellyak. The LP600 produces a spectrum across the range of the visible spectrum. The spectral profile produced by this type of instrument allows one to identify the elements present, determine the temperatures of stars, and record changes to the spectrum of a variable star or nova, for example. Here we see spectra from 
a NOVA obtained three weeks apart. The spectrum obtained on May 13, the one above, shows much stronger hydrogen bomb emission lines than those in the spectrum obtained earlier on April 4th. It also shows emission lines of helium and iron that were not discernible in the earlier spectrum. So this tells us something about the evolution of the expanding shell produced by this NOVA. And I'll speculate here a little bit, namely that the gas density has decreased to the point where more ionizing photons are getting through and that these photons are energetic enough to stimulate neutral helium into emission. Pretty cool stuff. You can also determine distances from spectrum. In this example, a spectrum of 3C273 was obtained with the LP600, and the redshift in the hydrogen lines was used to estimate its distance. In this case, the estimate was pretty close to the published value, attesting to the capability of this instrument. Some amateurs have developed their skills to the point where they want to engage in high-resolution spectroscopy. A high-resolution spectrometer, such as the one shown here, provides high spectral detail over a narrow wavelength range centered on a spectral region of interest. On the bottom is the LP600 with its spectral range of about 380 to 740 nanometers, pretty much across the visible range, and above it is the L-HiRes. The L-HiRes has a similar spectral range, but it's shifted about 90 nanometers toward the red. Um, while the, while the L-HiRes can image a spectrum only over a narrow window of about 16 nanometers or so, you can adjust that window across the range. So it's a very capable instrument in that respect. This graphic compares the relative resolutions of the LP600 and the L-HiRes 3. The red box on the left is the region displayed on the right. So you can clearly see the richness and detail of spectral features produced by the l high res 3 These instruments allow the astronomer to measure things like the speed of an object toward or away from the observer, the rotation rates of stars, and detailed changes in a circumstellar disk or shell, providing an understanding into the physical processes in these and many other interesting objects. And that concludes my part. I would like now to turn it over to Bob Buckheim for his discussion on basic terminology. Thank you, Scott. Um... Oh, I, before you get started, Bob, we mm -hmm. did allow, we, we were allowing for a few uh, questions. Questions. At the end, of, just a few questions, like two or three at the end of each section. So, uh, Lauren, if there are any questions that um, somebody wants to put forth, we, I can answer those right now. Um, yes, we have had a couple of questions, and both of them seem to really be asking about um, the suitability of inexpensive equipment for spectroscopy. What sort of projects would you want to tackle with, you know, a low resolution grading and DSLR combination, for example, or a medium resolution LP on a small telescope? A typical right. background. Break. So, in my opinion and Bob can chime in or others can dissent, I think the principal value, because that's how I got started. I got I started with an SA200 in my filter wheel. And I think the principal value of the slit list is to learn and do spectroscopy right away. It's not so much about the, um, the impactful science that one can do with slit lists, but rather it's such an easy entry point into spectroscopy. It's like hard not to do that. Um, you can you can do a number of things with slit lists, such as um, obtain spectra of different types of uh, variable stars. See what what um, see how see you can see how the Planck curve you know changes from type O through type M. Um, you can see how the uh, prominence of various spectral lines changes, and so you can really learn quite a bit. In fact, I'm kind of shaping uh, a little bit of an instructional program to come up in a, in a couple months in the spectroscopy section. Uh, for just that, how to learn um, spectra, the the um, how, how to learn about spectra by doing slitless. Excellent. Thank you. The one other question that I think would be relevant to take uh, right now is in that same vein, what's some kind of uh, ballpark limitations on spectral resolution and limiting magnitude with slitless versus slit. What are these different regimes we're talking about? 
Um, certainly as you go to higher resolutions, like you go from slitless to, I see Bob's got his companion there. <laughs> okay, his helper. Um, and, you know, slitless allows all of the light to come into and hit the sensor. With a slit, starting with the LP, um, <clears throat> attach that to a scope and you're allowing only a portion of the light to enter and hit the sensor. And because you're dispersing that light over um, a larger range than you are with the slitless, you're you're going to find yourself limited to brighter objects than with slitless. And the same goes with the with the high resolution. You're now dispersing that light even more, and so you're limited to even brighter object for telescopes of the same size. Um, so slitless can get you down. I can't give you a magnitude number. It depends on you, on your telescope, but um, you can get fairly faint with with slitless, um, and then as you get progressively into um, like the LP and the L high res, your ability to go faint diminishes. Mm -hmm. But of course, the fix is easy. Just get a larger telescope. <laughs> That's the solution uh, for a lot of problems. Uh, but of course, in spectroscopy, there there are trade offs regarding telescope size too. Part of the uh, uh, question related to a relatively small aperture uh, refractor, as I recall, uh, and there, the the question of brightness of the object and how long your spectral exposure would be uh, gets at how much of the star's light makes it through your slit, and uh, the as your aperture gets larger your focal length tends to get longer, which means the seeing disc of the star at the focal plane gets larger. And if you have a fixed slit size, a smaller fraction of that light is making it through the slit. Uh, and so you, as you go to a larger aperture, you do get more light, but it's a kind of a, uh, a decreasing payoff as uh, the uh, uh, seeing disc gets larger and larger. Um, you know, Scott showed the um, uh, spectrum of 3C273, and that guy's, what, 13 and a half magnitude? Pretty uh, faint. Yeah, that is correct, and that was with my 12-inch SCT and, and my LP600. Yeah, and, and you know, that's a good example of what you can do with a, you know, typical amateur-sized telescope uh, and an LP. Uh, you, can, you can go faint. You can do... Supernova, same way. So there's there's a lot of things that uh, uh, you can do. They're both educational and valuable. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, that's all the questions that we have in that vein right now. So I think we're good to go on to the next part of the presentation. Very well. Um, okay, am I sharing correctly? There we go. Um, I'm going to talk about some concepts and terms uh, that have special meaning in spectroscopy uh, and that seem to confuse uh, some novice spectroscopists. So hopefully I can I can help uh, you understand uh, these concepts that you'll hear about. The first is spectral resolution. Uh, here's a, a spectrum profile uh, of the form that uh, you hope to achieve with your instrument uh, in the standard uh, format of vertical axis is relative flux and the uh, horizontal axis is wavelength. Um, and this particular spectrum shows two absorption lines. Uh, the width of those lines is delta lambda in angstroms. The definition of spectral resolution parameter, R, is the center wavelength divided by the characteristic width of the spectral lines. This is a property not of the star. This is a property of your spectrograph, and it expresses your ability to resolve closely spaced spectral features, those absorption lines, uh, and your ability to detect or measure differences or changes in the line shape, its width, uh, maybe it's not as smooth as was. If delta lambda in this example were to get smaller, okay, the denominator gets smaller, so the resolution would get higher, and you might get this spectrum, smaller delta lambda, 
higher resolution, and you're able to see more detail in the uh, spectrum of the object. Here's a real world example. Uh, this is a spectrum of uh, a carbon star, Tu Tauri, uh, taken with an ALPI resolution R of about 500. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on this portion of the spectrum uh, so you can see that you see a lot of bumps and wiggles, uh, different uh, features in the spectrum. And now overlay in red a spectrum of the same star taken by UVEX. Uh, with a resolution about two and a half times higher than the ALPI. And you can see there's a lot more information in that uh, red spectrum. Uh, and in fact, there's enough resolution now that you can start to detect some of the critical spectral features that are used for classifying these carbon stars. Scott's already showed uh, a more extreme example of uh, the ALPI resolution of about 500 versus an L high res with a resolution of about 15,000. Uh, and you can see how much more detail you're seeing in that H alpha line with the uh, L high res spectrum. The penalty for high resolution is that whereas the ALPI spectrum shows the entire optical band from the deep blue uh, to the far red, the L high res, high resolution spectrum on the right, only shows this narrow range of wavelengths around H alpha, which is where the, the grading angle was set. And that's a general rule. The higher your resolution, the smaller a portion of the spectrum that you're going to see. Just like when you look through your telescope, higher magnification eyepiece, you get a narrower field of view. Now, there is an exception to that rule called an Echel spectrograph. It can give you the high resolution of the L high res on the right and the broad spectral range of the uh, ALPI on the left, but that's a very different beast, and we're not going to talk about it today. Now, where does R come from? What sets the resolution of your spectrograph? Uh, here's a, an, a simplified optical diagram of a generic spectrograph. The light from the star comes across the universe into your telescope, which makes an image of the star on the slit, the focal plane in the spectrograph. From that point, some of the light makes it through the slit and goes through a collimator, a dispersing element, the spectrograph's camera lens, and then focuses the rainbow, the spectrum, on the um, camera in the spectrograph. If you ignore this dispersing element, what you have here is a relay system that takes the, um, the slit and makes an Im of it, image of it down here on your focal plane. So if the star were like a laser, emitting a single precise wavelength of light, what you would see is an image of the slit. Uh, and it would be as wide as the slit is times whatever the magnification of the uh, that relay system is. Um, and that means it's the slit that is setting the resolution limit, uh, all other things being perfect. You can get Oops, sorry. You can get a higher resolution by using a narrower slit. Uh, but there is no free lunch. And so the price you would pay with a narrower slit is a smaller fraction of the starlight would get through the slit. So you need a longer exposure or a brighter target. Uh, so since R is set fundamentally by the instrument, the spectrograph, uh, your choice depends a little bit on what you're hoping to see in your spectrum. Um, there's uh, a, an overview spectrum, which is valuable for a whole lot of reasons, uh, with a broad spectral range. So you, you see the spectral profiles like you saw in your textbooks, and you can go to much fainter limiting magnitudes with the higher R. Uh, you get more detail. You can start measuring things like radio velocities, uh, rotation, uh, uh, surface gravity on the stars. Um, but you're focusing in on a very narrow region of the spectrograph. 
limiting magnitude is going to be brighter. I think most of the people I know using an L high res, uh, seventh or eighth magnitude is about as faint uh, as they can go. And there's a little bit more complexity in that instrument because you're adjusting grading angles. But there, uh, there are uh, educational and entertaining and scientific uses of uh, all of these instruments. Now, we've seen how R uh, is defined by the instrument. Uh, there's another parameter called equivalent width that you will uh, calculate from your spectrum. Um, the resolution R has, has set a lower limit on the width of the spectral lines. Um, how broad that spectral line is on this, again, characteristic drawing of relative flux versus delta lambda. Um, and you may have noticed on the prior examples that as the resolution got higher, not only did the spectral lines got, get narrower, but there was a tendency for them to become deeper. Um, and there are variable stars where the strength of the emission or absorption lines changes over time. So you'll be interested in how much light is removed from the, the signal as that emission feature uh, strengthens or weakens. And astronomers therefore need a way to consolidate observations from different resolution spectrographs to describe those changes. And the metric we use to describe the strength of a spectral feature is EW, the equivalent width. So you're seeing here a typical spectral profile of relative intensity versus wavelength with a sloping continuum shown here in red. Uh, and we describe the strength of the line, the amount of light that it removes from the continuum by the equivalent width equation shown here. At each wavelength, you take the continuum flux minus the flux in your spectrum, half, divide by the continuum, and then uh, sum that over the entire relevant spectral range where uh, the, the spectrum is different from the continuum. And what that equation amounts to is calculating the area uh, below the, the continuum contained in that absorption feature. Uh, dividing by the continuum in the equation is a process that you'll hear called rectifying the spectrum profile. Dividing by the continuum level so that if you plot rectified flux versus wavelength, the continuum is a flat line at one. The absorption feature uh, shows the spectrum falling below the continuum. Uh, An emission feature would show it uh, bumping up above the continuum level. Um, and in the same way, uh, you, the equivalent width is still calculating the area uh, below the continuum uh, bracketed by that um, uh, absorption feature. And in the, in the rectified flux plot, it's easy to understand where the units of equivalent width come from. The, the area of this dotted section is just a height times a width. The width is measured in angstroms because it's a wavelength. The height has no units because it's just a relative flux number. So even though uh, the units are angstroms, the equivalent width is not describing the width of the line. It's describing the area uh, between the continuum and the observed spectrum. Its units are our angstroms, but it's describing the strength of the emission and absorption feature. The neat thing about this calculation is it is independent of your spectral resolution. Uh, for example, if you look uh, at the, the graph on the left, if you took the same spectrum with a lower resolution spectrograph, the line would be broader, but less deep. And the area contained between it and the continuum would be the same as it was with the higher resolution spectra. Same over on the right with the, um, uh, the rectified spectrum. So now you have a way of, if I calculate an EW with my resolution of 1200 and you calculate an EW with your resolution of 500, we'll get the same number in almost all cases. Um, signal to noise ratio. Whenever a measurement of a signal is made, it is 
always accompanied by a random noise component, the uncertainty in the measurement. If you've done photometry, you know about this. It's also true for spectrum. Here's, here's the idea. Suppose your star puts out this spectrum, a sloping continuum, an absorption line. Say that's the underlying truth, but you don't know what that is. You only know what you measure. So you make a series of measurements of the spectrum of this object. Here's the first measurement. Here's the second measurement. Here's the third measurement and so on. Each measurement is a pretty good representation of the star spectrum, but none of them perfectly precisely match the underlying truth because each one of them is affected by random noise. All the usual noise sources apply to spectroscopy, the ones you're familiar with from photometry, uh, that some of which are random, like background noise and photon noise, uh, some of which are kind of fixed noise, pixel response, non-uniformity, uh, skylines, air glow, light pollution. And although mistakes are not noise, <laughs> they need to be guarded against. Um, and um, I guarantee you, uh, you will at some point make a beautiful spectrum of the wrong star. Happens to all of us. You need a way to detect that mistake before you submit your spectrum to AV spec or some other database. Um, in this example on the right, if we say that the signal is the strength of the continuum there at the minimum of the absorption line, and the noise is the one sigma variation around the continuum from, from our multiple measurements, we have a way of calculating a signal to noise ratio, signal divided by noise that describes the uncertainty in our measurement. More noise, lower signal to noise ratio means a less accurate measurement of the spectrum, which in the case of spectroscopy means you will see bumps and wiggles in your spectrum that are not real, they're noise. Here's a real life example. Uh, this is a spectrum taken with an ALPI of uh, the variable star AD Leo. These are three consecutive five minute exposures, spectrum created from each of them. Uh, and zoom in on the H gamma line uh, down on the lower left. And you see the three different colored lines. That's three individual spectra taken bang, 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 one right after another. Uh, and you see there's a signal there, the strength of the um, H gamma line. And if you look out at the continuum region, there's a fluctuation. They're, they're different. That's noise. That has an RMS value of sigma. Keep taking spectra of that star for the next two hours, one spectrum every five minutes, and you get what, you, what is shown here on the right. If you look out in the continuum, uh, there you see the same RMS uh, noise level uh, that uh, that we saw on the right. If you look on the right, you know the H gamma lines were not perfectly identically overlaid, but comparing the differences between the blue and the pink and the black one, you know they're no larger than the standard deviation of the noise. So that's not a real fluctuation. But on the left, or I'm sorry, on the right you see that the strength of that emission line is changing by a lot more than the standard deviation of the noise in the continuum. That's real. That's a stellar flare. So you might decide that the relevant signal in this example is not how high is the emission line above the continuum, but rather how big is the change in the strength of that emission line. And that decision turns out to be important important, in my humble opinion, whenever you calculate or hear somebody talk about signal to noise ratio. What is it that you mean by signal and what do you mean by noise? Is it the strength of the continuum or is it the change in the strength in the emission line or something else? Maybe the change in the position if you're looking for radial velocity. Um, it's very difficult may be impossible to estimate signal to noise ratio from a single spectrum. Yeah, I know there are people who try to do it, but you also need to look carefully at their algorithms. Um, what you want to do is 
take more exposures and longer exposures to maximize your signal, and that will minimize most noise sources. If everything in your system is absolutely perfect, you cannot get below the noise floor that's set by photoelectron statistics. And if your goal in the project that's, that you're making the spectrum for is a signal to noise ratio of 100, which is typical for a lot of projects, you must collect at least 10,000 photoelectrons per resolution element because the standard deviation of photoelectron noise is the square root of the number of photoelectrons. So that's a, a sort of a minimum uh, exposure duration uh, that you need to be thinking of. And if it's critical for you to know your signal to noise ratio, do what I showed on the, on the prior slide. Make a, a series of spectra from multiple consecutive exposures and then do a statistical analysis on those results. Finally, instrumental response. Uh, we've seen this optical diagram of a spectrograph before showing how the light makes its way from the star to your uh, CCD chip that collects the photons in the spectrum, the rainbow. Um, let's suppose that the light from the star as it arrived just above Earth's atmosphere looked like this, sloping continuum, couple of absorption features, and that's what you'd like to know. What, what was it that we got from the star? Uh, the problem, of course, is that the spectrum that we actually measure is something that, that we detect after the light has gone through all kinds of, of effects, the atmospheric absorption, uh, the transmission of our optics, the grading efficiency, the camera quantum efficiency, sampling effects in the uh, array of the camera, noise sources have been added. We've calculated what the um, wavelength equation is. And so what you see is this yellow dotted line that has some similar features, but is very different from uh, the light that left the star. Uh, if you've done your wavelength calibration right, these absorption features that you see are at the same wavelength as the absorption features that uh, the star emitted. That's good, but the signal level is, is way different. Um, a simplistic but very useful equation is what we observe from the star is what the star sent us times an instrumental response. And the instrumental response combines all of these effects uh, that our spectrograph did to the starlight. We call it instrumental response, but bear in mind, atmospheric extinction is one of those effects. So properly, it's the instrument plus the atmospheric. Uh, response to the starlight, but we all call it instrumental response. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this is a, a star HD 027295. It's a B9 main sequence star. Uh, this is the uh, spectrum that I measured on my CCD chip from this star. That is what I observed which is the star modified by my instrumental response. And you can see, you know, there's a pseudo continuum and there's absorption features. Uh, this was taken, uh, we think with a UVEC, so it spans about half of the optical range. Good news is I happen to know the instrumental response here. And it's this curve in pink, falls off badly at the blue end and starts to turn over because it will also, uh, quantum efficiency will drop uh, in the camera toward the red end. But since I know my observed profile and the instrumental response, I can solve this equation to get the light that actually came from the star uh, by taking my observed profile, dividing it by the instrumental response, and this in blue is the starlight that arrived at the top of Earth's atmosphere. If you look up this star in a uh, catalog of spectra, uh, it's the blue line that you'll see. 
Um, now, that begs the question, since the blue line is what I want and the black line is what I will actually measure on my CCD image, it begs the question, how do I figure out that pink line, uh, my instrumental response? And the answer is um, you observe a reference star whose exoatmospheric spectral profile is well known because it was measured and properly corrected for atmospheric effects and instrumental effects by a professional astronomer. If you take that fundamental equation that what I observe is what the star sent me times an instrumental response, if I know what I observed and I know what the star sent me because I have a well done, professionally done spectrum of the star, I can solve this equation for the instrumental response. I take what I observe from that star, what I observe from that star, and divide it by its known exoatmospheric professionally done spectral profile. What I get is my instrumental response. That's how I calculated the pink curve. And the moral of that story is every target that you observe in your spectrograph needs to be accompanied by a reference star that has a smooth spectrum with few features in it and a well done professional spectrum so that you can calculate your instrumental response. Uh, that reference star should be close in the sky to your target so it's passing through essentially the same atmospheric path, just like your comparison star in photometry. Um, and that way you can submit to AV spec and the other databases as they expect. Uh, spectral profiles that have been corrected for your instrumental response. That's my story and I am sticking with it. Uh, now let's talk about the value that your spectra can have. Take it away, Scott. Okay, I am... There we go. This should be the correct share. <clears throat> we did have a couple of uh, questions oh. relevant to what Bob had asked. Would you like to take a quick question break before we move on? Sure. Okay. Um, so we did have uh, several different questions on the theme of equiv equivalent width. If you could just elaborate a little bit more about what the physical meaning of equivalent width is, as well as... Um, confirm how it is that you obtain an equivalent width. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, let me go back to that slide, um, which would be here. Um, okay. Um, the the absorption line created at the star is almost infinitely thin. Uh, in fact, if I go out of, oh, I can't go out of out of um, a slideshow for some reason. Um, so if you if you could have an infinite spectral response in your spectrograph. What you would see in yellow here is you'd reach this point of absorption line and there'd be like a delta function straight down, you know, broadened only by some, some uh, quantum physics in the, uh, in the atoms of the star. So, but that delta function has a certain volume to it. When you smooth it by the instrumental response of your spectrograph or whatever your measuring instrument, that's what creates this, you know, sort of bell-shaped curve. It's got the same area as that infinitely thin delta function, but it's been smeared out a little to create this. Um, that's and that's kind of why you need to come up with a parameter for the strength of these lines that is independent of the resolution of your spectrograph. Uh, and that's, you know, this equation is 
you know, it's an integral, but you you solve it uh, as a as a summation for for every point on the spectrum here. In this region, well, the spectrum essentially equals the continuum. So continuum minus flux is going to be zero until you get here. Now you start getting a number and another number and another number, and you're adding them all up times you know, delta lambda, the the spacing between the the sample points. That's how you calculate equivalent width. Um, most of the software that you'll use to process your spectrum will have a tool that will calculate equivalent width for you. You'll, you know, you'll somehow tell it how to define the continuum and you tell it, I want to do this calculation from here to here and it'll calculate it for you. But what it's doing is a numerical integration. I hope that answers the question. I think it probably does. Thank you so much for elaborating. And speaking of software tools, the one other question that we had from that part to address right now is um, Steve Barks was wondering about the practical side of analyzing your signal to noise ratio. What sort of software or tools would you recommend and how can you actually verify that you hit your target signal to noise ratio? <laughs> yeah, it's it's harder than you imagine. On the other hand, if you're shooting for 100 uh, and you achieve 85, you're probably okay. If you achieve 115, it's, that's fine. There's no penalty for a uh, uh, better signal-to-noise ratio. Um, I believe most of the software packages that you're likely to use uh, have methods for uh, estimating signal-to-noise ratio. Um, I'm most familiar with ISIS. And if you if you have a spectrum profile and uh, you ask ISIS uh, what the signal to noise ratio is, uh, you, you you define a spectral range from here to here uh, and and it will compute a signal to noise ratio three ways. So it'll give you an SNR one, two, and three. And you have to dig a little to understand what the differences are. Um, if and but they fundamentally are based on the idea that any wiggle in the spectrum in that range you've defined is noise. Uh, SNR one just takes the spectrum as is and looks for any variations. Uh, the second one I think does a linear fit and looks for variations around that linear fit. Uh, but those are all, you know, reasonable, but kind of uh, hard to justify approximations. Uh, and that's why I say if it's really, really important to you, and particularly if, you're, if your object has a complex spectrum, like, you know, if you're looking at an M-class star, you know, there is no continuum there. It's just all this jumble of absorption features and, and, and band heads. Um, when you take your spectrum, you are going to take more than one image. You're going to take a dozen images. So rather than, uh, in addition to summing all of them and making a single spectrum from that dozen images, also make a dozen separate spectra. And now you can start looking for the fluctuations in that dozen and, you know, look for the RMS and the average levels. Okay, that's probably more than you wanted to hear, but that's what I do. That's a good level of detail. Thank you. And I believe that clears up uh, both of the main points of confusion that were left over there. So we're good to go on to the next part of the presentation. Thank you so much. All right, I should be unmuted. Um, so Bob, uh, can you hear me, Lauren? Yep, we can hear okay, you loud. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, Bob and I together are going to go through this last part, which is talks to a question we hear a lot. What is the value of amateur spectroscopy? Why should I spend time doing this? So to that end, uh, Bob, I'll take the, let's kind of talk together to the first two slides and I'll hand it over to you for the next few after that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me lead off with this. Um, so there's the question. Why, why is amateur or is you know, why are is amateur spectroscopy important? Um, it is absolutely. Um, one reason is that you know professional astronomers are limited in the type of objects and the amount of time they can observe an object. They're using large telescopes that you know 
they can't observe brighter stars because we just saturate their sensors. And, you know, the time at the big observatories, that's shared among many researchers, and you have to put in, you know, proposals for that time. And so it it limits amateur, uh, limits professional astronomers in their ability to, um, you know, track the behavior of some interesting object in a high time cadence. On the other hand, amateur astronomers, well, we can fill the gaps for the professionals, as well as engage in our own new research. Um, we have the dedicated capability to generate observations. We own our own observations. Um, we also can, um, because our telescopes tend to be smaller, we can uh, observe brighter stars and we can provide a higher observing cadence um, needed for observing objects with uh, like, you know, rapidly changing phenomena. And then, um, you know, collectively, we amateur spectroscopists can provide observations that supplement those made by the professionals and over longer time periods. And some examples of those include monitoring of activities of, in stars of interest, providing specific observations as a follow-up to professional observations, um, providing observations of special events such as nova eruptions. Bob, do you have anything to add to this? Um, yeah, one of the things to bear in mind when uh, you take a spectrum of your star tonight uh, you're probably the only person in the world looking at that star tonight. Uh, and so your data is the only evidence of what it was doing tonight. Uh, and that's uh, in, in despite the proliferation of gigantic professional sky surveys, uh, they can't hit everything all the time. Uh, the other <clears throat> freedom that we have is to uh, schedule our observations around unique events that have been predicted for these stars. And that's a lot harder uh, for a, um, uh, a professional observatory to do. And the bright star thing is not to be overlooked. Um, there was a, a really interesting meeting at the AAS meeting in Albuquerque uh, last summer. Uh, on the subject of what's the role of the small telescope observer in this new era of giant uh, professional surveys. And if you look at all of those big professional surveys, they have a bright limit. You know, they can observe supremely faint objects, but as the thing gets brighter and brighter, they reach a limit where their sensors saturate and they can't they can't go any higher. Well, those bright limits seem to run somewhere in the neighborhood of magnitude 15 to magnitude 10. So their bright limit is kind of right around our faint limit. The bright sky is still ours. Okay, I'll move on to the next. Here we go. Um, so let's just talk briefly about the scientific value of amateur spectroscopy. So the question is, are spectra produced by amateur astronomers scientific value? Going back to the like, you know, why should I spend my time doing this? Well, the short answer is yes, but there's some there's a but there's a but to that. Only if these spectra are of good quality and they support specific scientific objectives. That means you, that you followed established processes and procedures in generating and processing spectra. This, your spectra have been checked by yourself and perhaps others to verify their quality. The scientific objectives for the spectra are understood and the spectra you have taken support these objectives. And then finally, Bob brought this one up, the original images used in the processes are retained and available upon request. Bob, your comments? Yeah, it's um, it doesn't happen often, uh, but uh, if if you happen to be the one observing this uh, object or phenomenon on the critical night, uh, the professional researcher may want to say he or she is going to reanalyze using their uh, software, which is usually a little more complex than uh, what we amateurs use, to be able to verify what uh, what you think you have seen. Um, I, I, I've had that happen a few times with spectra, and I've had it happen 
uh, a few times with asteroid light curves that, that I'll get a call from some professional researcher 10 years later saying, hey, do you still have the images <laughs> from that night? Um, uh, so again, bright stars, um, you're the only person looking at it that night. And um, the, the value of we amateurs is uh, uh, really centered on time series observations. You know, you, you make a spectrum of a star and that's it. You know, you're not going to learn much from that uh, that isn't already known about that star, probably nothing. But if you get it tonight and tomorrow night and the next night and I don't know, for uh, uh, a period of time and you're observing changes in the spectrum of that star, you're probably the only person doing that also. Uh, and uh, measuring that time series at an appropriate cadence uh, is something that is very, very difficult for uh, the, the large observatories. And uh, there is a surprising number of features in uh, spectral variations of um, uh, variable stars that are well within our range that are still not understood. And um, uh, our data is needed to get a better handle on what's going on out there in those stars. Okay, next, moving on to the next slide. Uh, having troubles getting this thing to advance properly. There we go. Uh, Bob, this slide, the next slide, you, would you like to talk about some of the types sure. of observing projects that amateurs can do? Sure. Um, you know, pulsating stars are, are one of uh, those categories of variable stars that uh, AAVSO photometrists have been uh, studying for over 100 years, making light curves. Well, if a star is pulsating, um, then there's more going on than just a brightness change. Uh, the magnitude of that brightness change is different in B band versus R band. Uh, and by making time series spectra uh, instead of uh, multicolor light curves, you're getting a much finer picture of the uh, nature of the change in the energy coming out of the star uh, as it goes through its pulsation cycles. Um, I think on a, on a slide coming up, uh, there will be reference to a paper uh, by David Boyd of uh, his spectrophotometry of some short period uh, pulsating stars that it's it's worth reading in JAVSO. It is um, he took uh, time series spectra that shows the uh, spectral type changing because the temperature of the star is changing while it pulsates. And the photometry, so the I think it was V-band brightness changing, and you get an entirely different picture of, of what's happening out there at the star. Temperature, brightness, uh, changing together, but not simultaneously. Um, there are questions about uh, Myra's, there are questions about RR Lyra's that uh, need answers and that uh, the combination of spectra, time series spectra and photometry over the, the whole pulsation cycle uh, is a real contribution to seeing what those uh, stars are doing. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one, Bob. Mm -hmm. Back to you. Uh, emission <laughs> stars. Uh, particularly for the uh, my friends with uh, the L high res, the high resolution uh, uh, instruments, uh, the emission line stars are are favorites. Um, the at the bottom of the list is the BE stars, uh, which imagine a hot blue star B classification spinning rapidly, so rapidly that material is flowing off of the star into a decretion disk. And so when you put that star in the slit of your spectrograph, you're seeing the star and you're seeing the disk uh, in your spectrum. And depending on um, the density and temperature of the disk and the inclination of the star's rotation axis to your line of sight, um, that spectrum can change dramatically. Uh, sometimes you look and it's just a normal B-type spectrum. Uh, 
uh, you look again and there are these gigantic emission lines, uh, usually at the bomber lines. And you look again and it's a giant emission line with an absorption feature in the middle. Uh, and then it, you know, the ratio between the blue half and the red half changes as that disk is changing, maybe precessing, um, very dynamic and uh, not completely understood. So our kind of spectra, uh, are used in modeling those systems and learning more about uh, how they work. All right. Oh, and I yep. forgot to mention there is a role in in the BE star world for uh, the low resolution spectra, the ALPIs, and probably the slitless. Um, if you if you look at the number of emission line stars versus magnitude. It appears that we have not yet discovered a big number of them at the relatively faint magnitudes. And that's almost certainly an observational effect. You know, if you've got an L high res, you, you can't look at a 12th magnitude uh, star to see if it's got an emission feature, but you can with your ALPI and you can with your SA100. And some of the French spectroscopists have an active project searching for those undiscovered uh, BE stars, and they, they're finding a few. They're out there. Um, finally, um, if, if after you've, uh, the first thing you do with your spectrograph is the same thing you did with your new telescope. Look at everything. <laughs> look at the moon, look at the stars, make a, a map of different spectral types, look at some planetary nebula. Uh, and after, after you've done that and you start saying, I want to study a few particular stars, and you do that, um, and you, you find yourself one night wondering what, what's the project I should get involved in this season. Um, the AAVSO alerts uh, come in from professional researchers requesting our spectra uh, of a target that's of interest to them. And I'm thrilled that uh, uh, this project came along just uh, last month from uh, Dr. Bennett about um, uh, V695 Cygni. Uh, as far as I can tell, I'm the only one who got spectra of it during, during the uh, first uh, part of its eclipse. This is a huge red giant star with a little B type, I think main sequence star in orbit around it, 10 year orbit. And so once every 10 years, that that little teeny B star goes behind the, the big red giant star. And during the part where the eclipse is partial, you can use that, that bright little B star as a probe of the outer atmosphere of the red giant. And, and the spectrum of that, that system changed dramatically over the three or four days when that was going on in uh, in uh, late February, it it will be coming out of the eclipse in April. You need to get on it. It's it's really remarkable to see, and and that star V six ninety five Cygnus V magnitude is like three point five. It's really really bright. Uh, great target for all of you. All right, I'm going to move on and just want to make a quick comment uh, for all the meeting participants. We're kind of just a few minutes past the uh, the one hour. Uh, we've, we're almost done. So if you just hang in with us, we'll be wrapping this up in just a few moments. So I'll just state very briefly about this slide uh, that in, in addition to everything Bob has talked about, you can actually conduct your own research, either yourself or in collaboration with others, and you can publish it um, here's some examples out of the Journal of the AVSO um, of um, papers that have been published on various topics. Um, I picked out the ones that included spectroscopic observations. So that is, Bob, do you have any, anything you want to add to this besides just my laundry list of some examples here? Um, yeah, the um, I think T. Cephi. Uh, is uh, the one I was talking about where David Boyd looked at uh, spectroscopy and photometry and printed the, the discovered the sort of hysteresis curve between 
brightness and spectral classification. Really neat paper. Uh, just to, in, I think in the last issue of JAVSA, worth looking at. Um, and uh, there's a, let's see, down near the bottom, high-res spectroscopy to measure Cepheid pulsation. Just because the star shows up in... Uh, in uh, Simbad as a well-known and well-characterized Cepheid it doesn't mean that you shouldn't take a look at it. Um, the Cepheid variables sometimes act badly. Uh, their amplitude of pulsation changes. Uh, 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 sometimes they stop pulsating altogether and uh, their spectral characteristics sometimes are not what they used to be. Uh, so good. Good project for small telescope spectroscopy. Okay, um, this and one more slide, and then we'll, we're we're done here. So, um, it is important to note that the value of your spectra can only be realized when you share them with others. Keep them to yourself; doesn't help anybody. So, to this end, the AVSO maintains a repository of spectra of variable stars called AV Spec. We've mentioned this before. AV spec is where you can submit your variable star spectra, uh, as well as download and take a look at the spectra others have submitted. Each spectra submitted is quality checked by AVSO staff, and feedback is provided as a way to help you learn and improve. We always want to do that. You can find the link and information on AV spec in the spectroscopy section under observing sections on the AAVSO homepage. And then finally, the AVSO spectroscopy section, of which I'm the new section lead, is the place to go for anyone interested in doing spectroscopy of variable stars. The section contains educational and instructional materials, recommended programs of observations, and other useful information. Although I am in the process of kind of you know redoing and adding information, so it's still a little bit of a work in progress. Um, here's what I want you to take note of. We conduct online meetings on the second Wednesday of each month, the next one coming up next Wednesday. And these meetings are open to anyone and everyone of all skill levels, beginners, advanced, even those that, you know, want to know more and share or share their knowledge with others. Some of these meetings are open discussions and others have presentations, but in either case, the purpose is for everyone involved or wanting to be involved in spectroscopy to have the opportunity to learn new skills and improve existing ones. So this concludes our presentation. And Lauren, I'll turn it back to you for questions, discussion, and general uh, webinar management. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott, Bob. That was excellent. Okay, so um, we have quite a lot of questions in the queue here, uh, which we'll get to very shortly. First, I just want to go ahead and reinforce what Scott was just saying about the spectroscopy section being a great place to start. Um, as a now independent person from the spectroscopy section, Scott's an awesome leader. He he does a great job of heading up these meetings, and it's really the best uh, group that I know of for learning spectroscopy. So do what he said and check it out. Um, I think you'll I think you'll be glad that you did. Okay, so um, how about let's go sort of in reverse order of the topics that you guys just covered most recent first. We had a couple of questions on the topic of uh, spectroscopic databases. In particular, someone wanted to know um, which astronomical databases do each of you mostly use and submit your data to? Um, for me, it's uh, AV spec and sometimes the BAA, British Astronomical Association uh, Spectral Database. Uh, for me, it's just the uh, AV spec. But then, um, although your nice introduction, Lauren, would paint the picture of me being super experienced, the fact is I'm still kind of a beginner in many respects. And so I'm still learning. Um, and in addition to helping others learn, I'm helping to myself to learn. And so what specter I have been able to contribute has been just the AV spec. Or um, uh, two other databases that uh, many of you may find valuable, uh, either for submitting data or for seeing the, the specter that other people have made. 
our uh, ARAS, A-R-A-S, Astronomical Range for Access to Spectroscopy, which is uh, one of the uh, French databases of a wide variety of um, uh, targets and instruments. And the BESS, uh, the BE Star Spectra Database, uh, also a French uh, database uh, focused on those BE stars, most of the spectra being uh, L high res or equivalent, but you'll also find Alpies and Lisas in there. And it's a really good way to see what uh, other people are seeing in these stars and uh, give you a model for what you're striving for uh, with, uh, with your instrument uh, observing these objects. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, let's see. Our, our next question on the topic of AV spec here, actually, um, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about it, but I may also be able to speak to it a little bit since I work with AV spec as part of my role at the AABSO. Um, this attendee is wondering why AV spec has its rule of not accepting normalized spectra with the continuum removed, um, given that watching the evolution of absorption lines without uh, considering the continuum can still be valuable for science sometimes. Yeah, Lauren, that is for you to answer, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, the internal logic that we had when we went ahead and implemented that rule was basically that normalization is more of an analysis step than it is a reduction step. You know, you can do it in order to calculate equivalent widths, and it's very useful when you're doing that. But there's a chance that when you do it, you're going to uh, add some distortions. You know, we often see wave-like distortions next to the spectral lines when we do a normalization. And you're also losing any information that was there in the continuum, like the amount of reddening or the temperature of the star, things like that. So when it's something that the researcher themselves can easily do when they want to do that analysis, and it loses some information along the way, we'd rather just have the original spectrum. That was our logic. Okay, and I'm just gonna chime in on something where this is kind of common and everyone listening should be aware of this, that there tends to be a little bit of overlap or inconsistencies in our terminology. So what Bob referred to as rectification, Lauren spoke to it as normalization. And so when you hear either of those terms, just ask another question to understand what's meant. Um, so, but Lauren's point is well taken. That additional step basically takes information and could introduce some anomalies that um, would best be left out. Great point about the terminology there. Um, there's definitely several cases of that in our field of spectroscopy with synonymous terms. I'm actually surprised Bob did not cover that in his section too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see. Next, let's ping over to some of these questions that we got about equipment and optics. Um, one of the most common questions was about the various optical designs of telescopes, refractor, reflector, CDK, SCT. Which ones are most suitable for spectroscopy and what should you take into consideration? Bob, let me, let me start that one and you can finish after I muck it up. Um, <laughs> at, a, at a very high level, um, any telescope that has minimal or no refractive elements to it is ideal. Bob? Um, let's see. Um, my, my first answer to that is whatever telescope you have, use mm -hmm. it. Um, there, there are compromises uh, in, in all telescope designs, and uh, uh, you will you will figure out in your you know first few months of spectroscopy uh, how they're affecting yours. Um, don't be afraid of very modest aperture refractors, um, uh, and you know if if you're bound and determined to have an all reflective system, you know get an RC. Um, the the I think biggest concern about uh, refractors is chromatic aberration means that the image of the spectrum, that streak of light that will be on your uh, camera, um, is going to get wider at the blue end than at the red end because of the chromatic aberration in your 
um, uh, in your uh, telescope, which means, you know, your signal level is going to be a little lower because less light is falling on the uh, slit down at that at the blue end. That's going to influence your instrument response, and it's going to make it a little bit harder for you to ensure Uh, that you're calculating a correct instrument response, but that's all doable. Um, uh, there, there are people making wonderful uh, spectra with uh, small aperture, uh, non-APO refractors. So don't don't yeah. be and, scared of, of that. Use what you have and, and uh, uh, take advantage of it. Bob, I just want to add to that. I agree 100%. Um, and, I, and I think that the application of proper procedure and methods in acquiring and processing your spectra accounts for way more than any of the things you talked about, you know, refraction in, in your telescope optics. So um, don't be afraid to use whatever scope you have handy. Um, get out there and start, you know, doing some spectra. And we will, if you need to, we'll help you and we'll teach you how what the proper procedures are. Yeah, ab absolutely right. Anytime there's a sort of a manual judgmental procedure and determining instrumental response uh, contains some of that, you need to figure out uh, a a pipeline for yourself that is is as repeatable as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So um, next up, we have a question here from John Guinaldi who asks if you have any specific recommendations for choosing equipment, especially a spectrograph, when you want to get started in spectroscopy, slit spectroscopy in particular. Okay, uh, let, let me chime in. If you're the, the question was about getting started. Yes. Right. And I kind of come back to that, the slit list, the SA 100, 200 on the front of a DSLR in your filter wheel. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's a really low cost, great entry point to, you know, start, start doing spectroscopy, uh, start collecting spectra, you know, like do what Bob did, like, or what Bob talked about, you know, look at, look at uh, Uranus and Neptune to detect methane bands, uh, you know, look at bright BE stars to try to detect the emission, uh, the H alpha emission. Um, you know, to me, that is a great way to get started right here, right now, and start learning about spectroscopy. And then once you've kind of waded into the pool a little bit, then you'll be at a point where you can start making decisions about, well, do I want to go low res with an LP or something like that, or go high res or just what? So my recommendation is start with a, a simple SA 200 and, and, and some cheap software to go with it, or inexpensive software, not cheap, inexpensive software to go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, getting, getting some experience with spectroscopy will do a couple of things. You'll, you'll learn how to take the spectra, how to analyze them, uh, how to interpret them. And most importantly, uh, it will help you decide, do I enjoy this? Am I interested in it? Uh, and if the answer is no, well, you know, you've you've invested two hundred dollars. If the answer is yes, you know, I I'm excited about the ability to see things and phenomena that were invisible to me before. Uh, then um, uh, you at least have a basis for deciding: Do I want a a low res like an Alpi? That was that was my first slit spectrograph, and uh, I, I loved it. I still have it. Uh, or uh, if you, you know, bound and determined, the thing I really want to see is radial velocities. Well, you know, get yourself an L high res or a star X uh, or a uh, low spec and go for it. Excellent advice. Thank you. Okay, so that addresses the equipment side of things for getting started. What about the resources and education side of things? Do you have any particular resources that you would recommend to people who are wanting to set up their own spectroscopic rig and dive in? <laughs> uh, this book by Francois Cochard is a great uh, way to start from a standing start uh, and uh, uh, understand uh, slit spectroscopy, Amazon or wherever you can get it. Thanks for the recommendation. 
Scott, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I'm just, I think what Bob, that book is a great starting spot. That was my starting spot and I highly recommend it. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we have a couple more questions back on the equipment topic before we move to a different topic. So um, we had someone who asked about, you know, you said at the beginning that you're not going to cover a shell spectrographs, that's fair. Um, but on the topic of resources, for someone who does have an shell, do you have any recommendations for where to go look to learn about using one? Um, yeah, uh, I'd send you to Christian Buell's website, B-U-I-L. Uh, he's the fellow who wrote the unfortunately named ISIS software. And in the um, uh, the instructions for, for using ISIS, he has a, a big section on analyzing a shell spectra. Great recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Um, and here we have a specific question about the new LP200 spectrograph. This was mentioned by Steve Barks. Um, the advantage of the LP200 being that it can go very faint. Are there any ongoing campaigns, AAVSO or general science projects that this would be particularly well suited to with its very deep limiting magnitude? I don't think I've seen any campaigns aimed at it, but uh, it was developed uh, for the purpose of measuring supernova spectra. And, um, and that's why uh, you want to go really faint. And um, um, uh, Robin Leadbeater in uh, England uh, has, has shown that he kind of made a prototype for himself several years ago. Um, you know, he can go really faint and you can classify uh, supernova spectra with an instrument like that on a modest uh, amateur scale telescope. Hey, Bob, I have kind of a, a question for you to answer this question. Um, in your presentation, you had mentioned, uh, or in part three, you had, you talked about the BE stars and it's, you know, the idea is that there's probably lots of BE stars and the fainter magnitudes that have not been cataloged. Would the LP200 be a good instrument for that purpose? Um, yeah, maybe. Um, like any slit spectrograph, it's a one object at a time uh, thing. And I I think they're using uh, slitless for their survey because, you know, now I can take a, you know, half a degree square block of the sky and get a spectrum of everything in there. Uh, and search for uh, emission lines and then cross-reference against uh, spectra. But um, it's uh, anytime you're, you need to go or want to go faint, uh, lower resolution is how you do it. Hey, um, one more question about equipment and then we're gonna change to a different topic. So uh, this came up from multiple people. The possibility of doing both uh, photometry and spectroscopy with the same telescope. Is that doable for amateurs at least? Um, especially, you know, when you're considering you have a relatively small telescope and a large spectrograph like an Elhiris 3, how do you set that up? Everybody I know who is doing uh, simultaneous photometry and spectroscopy is using two telescopes. The, the mm -hmm. photometry setup might be piggyback uh, onto the spectroscopy scope. But, uh, you know, once once the light has uh, passed through the slit, um, you, you don't really have an option of doing photometry on that light and as part of the spectrograph. Uh, but um, since your spectroscopic targets are going to be relatively bright, uh, you don't need a, as big an aperture as you might otherwise think for the photometry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, everybody I know is using two telescopes. Uh, often they're on the same mount. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, we did have a few different questions come in about instrument response correction. So the first one here is about the process itself. When you when you do your instrumental response correction, does that also change the relative flux of the spectrum to absolute flux? Or are there additional steps that you need to take if you want absolute flux? 
Yeah, the answer is um, it the procedure I described turns it into relative but um, corrected flux for the instrumental response curve, not um, uh, absolute flux in ergs per square centimeter per second per angstrom. Uh, that's a separate step that it entails combining um, uh, your um, now known exoatmospheric flux profile, combining that with uh, photometry in a known filter band. Did, did we record the talk about that at the spectroscopy section meeting? Sadly, no. We oh. just have a slide deck that you shared. <laughs> oh, but the, okay, the slides are available? Yes, so the slides are available on the spectroscopy section's webpage. Send, send that person there. All right. Good I think, and I think that the discussion will be understandable without me babbling through it. It was a good set of slides, yes. Okay, um, two more questions here on the topic of instrument response correction. Here's an interesting one from Geoff Forden, who would like to know when you are using um, the professional reference spectrum to create your instrument response curve, does it need to have the same resolution as your spectrograph? Uh, no, uh, but I, I, it probably should be similar in, uh, in resolution. Um, uh, there's a there is a bit of a manual art in um, um, you know you take uh, somebody else's professionally done spectrum profile and you're going to divide that into your spectrum profile. Uh, I mentioned that you want the star that you're doing that to to be having a pretty smooth spectrum without a lot of features in it, uh, and that's because differences in resolution will show up as spiky artifacts. Uh, in that uh, arithmetic between the two spectrum, uh, you can you can reduce those if you filter um, either your spectrum or the more likely the professional spectrum to be approximately the same um, resolution. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing that kind of filtering, but then you're going to smooth the result over those spiky artifacts anyhow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Bob, I uh, recently have been uh, working with um, another project. In Bass Project, there is a resample profile mm -hmm. tool, and I think that is something that could be applied in this case. Yeah, and there's a there's a comparable in, in ISIS a smoothing parameter that does a, a Gaussian convolution. Um, and, um, uh, and you need to uh, you you go through that process, and you know Scott talked about having a repeatable process consistency uh, to uh, what you're doing. Um, the the very first check you make is that uh, you since you've made a spectrum of that reference star with your uh, instrument, uh, run that through again using the instrument profile you calculated. And if your result does not look like the professional spectrum of that star, something went wrong. And, and you need to you know, look into your procedures and smoothing an instrument uh, calculation to make sure you get that right before you apply it to your uh, target. Great point. It's very important to do those kind of checks. Okay. Um... Our last question here about instrument response. So in terms of choosing your reference star, if your target of interest, the variable star you're going to be studying is an M star or something that's really red, but then you use a class A or B reference star that's very blue, will that result in inaccuracy at the longer wavelengths? Um, it should not. Uh, the purpose of the reference star is to determine your instrumental response over the spectrum range that you're taking of your target. Um, and um, so, I, you know, I use, you know, A or B type stars as the reference star to determine instrumental response and apply it to um, uh, very cool stars. The, uh, the spectrum I showed of TU Tauri, uh, which is a very red, you know, M giant, I think, uh, uh, and it's got 
all that complicated uh, stuff in the spectrum, you don't want to try to fit that in order to uh, make an instrument response curve. Mm -hmm. You use a relatively simpler spectrum across the whole spectrum range that you're observing uh, to make your instrument response curve and then apply it to your M star. And it, and it works fine. If you, uh, you know, you, in, in your process of developing your procedures, you know, you will take a spectrum of a known M star and a, a type reverend star run through your sequence and you get a hopefully properly um, uh, corrected M star spectrum. And then you go compare that to the known professional spectrum of that star. And you should discover that what you got uh, is uh, essentially identical to what they got. That says right. your procedure's working. So the main, the main problem with using like a, a, maybe a K or an M star as a reference for, um, is <clears throat> you've got just tons of molecular bands, like the TIO molecular bands. And it's, you know, where's the continuum? Hard to pick out the continuum in those stars. And that's what you need. You basically need to extract the continuum from the reference star to create your, um, your instrument response. So um, I concur with Bob. You could use a type A, even a type B, or, you know, um, as long as you're able to, to extract, to tease out the continuum, um, by just sort of, you know, getting rid of the, or the software will get rid of the uh, absorption features. It'll work um, on your K and M um, stars just as well. Yeah, because that instrumental response curve that you're trying to create is a function not of the star. It's a function of your instrument and your atmosphere. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, um, next up, we have a couple of questions about smart telescopes. So uh, first, just kind of in general, what do you think about the potential of smart telescopes for spectroscopy? I think somebody should try it and <laughs> and send a send a paper to either JABSO uh, or SAS and report on what you learned. That sounds like a great idea. You know, get because I think most of the smart telescopes being sold uh, will take an inch and a quarter filter, and uh, so get yourself an SA one hundred and screw it in there and see what happens. All right, sweet. Okay, and, and tell our, the rest of us. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Very curious to hear about that. Our other question here about smart telescopes was um, from Jerry Backman, who actually has a C-Star S50 telescope. That's the little 50 millimeter aperture one um, and wants to get started with spectroscopy with that telescope. Now, Jerry's heard that there have been successful experiments using a grating in front of the telescope in an objective grating configuration. What should be kept in mind if you're doing this objective grading spectroscopy and you want to use your observations for science? I think the, I think, well, I'll see what Bob has to say, but just off the top of my head, I think um, the primary consideration is the distance between the grading and the sensor, because the closer the grading is to the sensor, the, the broader the spectrum, the more it's dispersed, even to the point sometimes where you lose the, the, um, the zero order image of the star. And the farther away the grading is, then the tinier that spectrum becomes. So for your particular camera or sensor, there is a sweet spot of distance to the, to the sensor that you want to kind of maintain. Um, but remember, he's thinking of an aperture grading, um, like the picture you showed of the DSLR camera with an SA100 in front of its lens. And um, that may that may bear fruit. Um, uh, the The trick there is the focal length of that uh, C star. Uh, if If you put a um, uh, setup like Scott showed with a, a an SA100 as a um, an aperture grading on your DSLR, uh, when I was playing with it, use the normal kit zoom lens. And if you zoom to, uh, I can't remember, it must have been short focal length 
you get the zero order and the spectrum all in the field of view. And as you zoom out in wavelength, you know, they kind of, and the spectrum, of course, spreads out. Um, and you want to be able, with a slitless system, you want the zero order to be visible as well as the spectrum. But, um, I, I, hey, try it. Uh, uh, bright stars, it might be really good. The other thing you might see, uh, I don't remember if uh, Tom Field sells the two degree prisms uh, that uh, can be mounted onto the um, uh, SA100 gratings. But, you know, if you get one of those prisms, you might be able to use it as an aperture prism, just like in the old days. Uh, and, you know, replicate uh, what was going on at, at Harvard back in the, what, 1850s. That would be a very interesting experiment. Okay, thank you. So let's see. Our next question here is about making observations with just a slitless grading filter and a color CMOS camera. Can you use these color cameras and simple setups for scientific observations, or do you have to have a traditional spectrograph with a slit and monochrome camera? Um, I, th I think the answer is yes, you can. Um, the trick is the color camera, uh, because now you have three instrumental response curves from the R, the G, and the B channels. Uh, and I I suspect what most people do is uh, take the image and debayer it. So say, for example, you only look at the at the uh, G band pixels and then do all your spectra analysis that way. Lauren, is that how you've been doing it? Or do you use, you use a monochrome camera? I use a monochrome camera. I have, however, used a color camera in the past. When I did, it was basically an issue of the instrument response curve became more complex because there were three peaks in the quantum efficiency from the three color filters. Mm -hmm. um, but I was still able to do the reduction as long as I was careful about how I fitted that instrument response curve. Great. So the answer is go for it. Right. But wouldn't your resolution also be reduced because of the, the bear matrix? Yes, I believe so. Um, so you just you just have to take that into account when you're when you're calculating your resolution and your dispersion. Yeah, although that may not the sampling problem. Uh, I don't know when I was playing with an aperture grading on a DSLR. You know, the resolution was set by the blur circle of the star, mm -hmm. and you know it was way more than one pixel. Yeah. I remember that one of the main concerns when I was shooting Spectra with the DSLR was that the arrangement of the Bayer array meant that the spectrum needed to have significant sampling vertically or else there would be a wavelength bias because you might accidentally yeah. sample many more uh, green pixels than there statistically are in the Bayer array because you land on that row, you know? Oh, that's uh, a good point. So, so you may have to defocus a little. <laughs> Yeah, defocus or even allow the spectrum to trail somewhat vertically. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay, so um, speaking of cameras, <laughs> we did have a perennial question show up here in the chat. And that is, within the context of spectroscopy, CCD versus CMOS. Which should you use? What should you take into consideration? Um, I used a CCD with my Alpi, and I am currently using a CMOS with my UVEX. And uh, they both work great. Um, each of the cameras has some unique features that uh, you, you need to gain a little understanding of the the parameters and specs of your camera, both monochrome. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the properly used, the two cameras can work just fine. Um, uh, and and I, I think 
uh, the, well, the CMOS is still an evolving technology and they're getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Um, I think, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be really hard to buy a, a monochrome CCD for our kind of budgets, but they, they work great. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, back on sort of the equipment topic, we had a question here from Jose Riverio who asked about light sources for taking flat frames. What is your recommendation? Um, well, first, if you're using slitless, don't bother. Uh, there, there's no no way to make a meaningful flat in a slitless spectroscopy uh, setup. Uh, for your slit spectrograph, I, most people use tungsten lamps in, in one way or another. Uh, you, you, you want something that has a smooth uh, spectral profile of the lamp. You know, you don't want to get a mercury vapor lamp or something like that. Um, but, you know, a tungsten lamp. And uh, if, if, if you buy your instrument from Shellyac, uh, you buy their calibration module, it has a tungsten bulb in there that'll give you flats. Alternatively, you take a tungsten bulb and you know open your shutter and wave it in front of your telescope aperture for the right number of seconds and, and you'll get a, a, a good flat. I think, I think that's what Christian Buell still does. <laughs> You know, maybe puts a sheet over the aperture and waves a tungsten bulb all over the and collects light that way. What works works. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, also, sort of in the vein of flats, sort of not. We had a question from Joe Hobart, who's curious if you have any tips for increasing blue response. I know that's a problem with a lot of spectrographs is very low response in the blue. Um. I, and it's mostly driven by the quantum efficiency of your camera, I think. Um, secondarily, it's probably driven by the optical transmission of any refractive elements. You know, if you're a Schmidt cast, the corrector plate, if you're a plane wave uh, corrected RC, then it's that, that corrective lens. Um, the... Uh, I don't think there's a way to increase the blue throughput uh, without dealing with your choice of equipment. You know, look look for blue quantum efficiency in the camera, and then look at a way to have an all reflective system. Yeah, I was only going to add, Bob, that uh, try to target objects at um, small zenith angles or high elevation, mm -hmm. because extinction is differential by wavelength. Uh, the reason we have red setting suns is because at that low elevation, the blue's been scattered out, right? Leaving most mostly red. Same thing with your spectra. If you're um, obtaining spectra at low elevation angles um, or high zenith angles, um, same thing. A lot of that blue is is you know being filtered out. Um, so um, try to stick with objects at relatively high elevation angles. That will help. That, that is a really important point. You know, if photometrists learned that uh, if you if you're below about 30 degrees elevation angle, you know, an air mass of two, all kinds of bad things can happen, and and it's equally bad, maybe worse, in spectroscopy, uh, shooting targets close to the horizon. There's a myriad of things that uh, uh, you would not have to worry about if you were shooting near the zenith. You know, up yeah. here is good. I mean, since, since your camera is already like least or less sensitive in the blue end and then at low elevation, it just aggravates that problem even more. So you're not going to eliminate the um, the loss of blue, but you can try to do what you can to minimize. Okay, thank you. And um, speaking of sky conditions, this seems like a good place to segue into the questions that we got about light pollution. So how do you deal with light pollution in spectroscopy and how much can you expect to see if you're living in an urban or suburban area? Hey, Lauren, before we actually jump into that question, Bob, the last question about loss of blue, should I even bring up slit rotation? Wow. We had a question about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh you know, parallactic angle is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, so Bob and I have had discussions and I gave a presentation um, not too long ago 
on um, the effect of you know not rotating your slit appropriately. What you're doing is you're really kind of cutting out a lot of the blue, a little bit of the red, but mostly the blue. So it's another thing you can do to minimize your blue loss is orient your slit properly. And details of that um, should be, Lauren, did you post my presentation back onto the observing section website? Yes. Okay, so there it is. So it could just direct people to that. Okay, on to that next question, Lauren. Okay, uh, so the question was about light, oh, light pollution. pollution, dealing with it, and what can you expect to see if you live in an area with a lot of light pollution? So starting, you know? starting with your next door neighbors, um, <laughs> go ahead, Bob. Well, you know how uh, if you live in a heavily light polluted suburban area uh, and you go out to do conventional astro imaging and, you know, the sky looks kind of this muddy greenish gray and all that. Uh, but if you start shooting narrowband through an H alpha and an oxygen three filter, you know, you take an hour long exposure and there is no skylight in your image. Similar kind of thing going on with spectroscopy. Uh, you, you will see um, uh, the, an, a, at, at specific wavelengths, you know, the sodium lines uh, will show up in the sky, but um, uh, in in many ways, spectroscopy is more forgiving than conventional astro imaging. And, to I, light I, pollution. and I would agree with that. Probably the, the 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 effect of light pollution, in my opinion, is less on the actual spectrum and more like on your your guider, right? Your mm -hmm. guiding camera, where now things are a bit more washed out. It's hard to pick out guide stars. Yeah. So um, you know, darker is better top of a mountain is better, you know, two meter telescope is better, but if you can't have all that, uh, you know, I, I, we've mentioned Christian Buell. Christian lives in Paris. His observatory is his apartment balcony looking toward the Eiffel Tower. And, and, you know, that's like New York City. Uh, and he gets fabulous spectra. Absolutely. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so um, speaking about the effect of location, or in this case, the non-effect on what kind of results you can get, um, we had a question actually about northern versus southern hemisphere observing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of very spectroscopically interesting stars in the southern hemisphere, but historically there haven't been many observers down there. Are Is the amount of data coming into these databases fairly balanced nowadays in terms of hemispheric coverage, or is there still kind of like a big gap there for Southern Hemisphere observers? Hmm. Just looking at population density, I would guess that the Southern Hemisphere is, um, uh, doesn't show up as often, but, but there are really active uh, uh, amateur spectroscopists in Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think South Africa also. All right. I see that um, Steve Shore, who is involved with the uh, AVSO spectroscopy section as science advisor, he's just commented that there is quite a big gap in uh, spectroscopic coverage in the Southern Hemisphere, excepting Chile and Australia. And that makes sense. I can say from Personal experience, my personal experience is limited because I only get to see AV spec out of the large range of databases that are out there. But in AV spec, we don't have a whole lot of Southern Hemisphere observers. We have a couple, but not many. So there's definitely an opportunity there. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere or even just the Southern part of the Northern Hemisphere, you know, see if you can push your Southern horizon and monitor some of those really interesting stars down that way. So before we were telling them stay above two air mass, 30 degrees. Now we're telling them to go lower. Oh, that's a fair point. Perhaps <laughs> okay. I have a bad influence. That's, that's okay. No, it, it actually goes to the point of there's no hard and fast rules. You know, ideally, like if you want to preserve your blue, you want to image, you know, high. But at the same time, you can't neglect targets that, that are necessarily um, interesting or scientifically interesting if they just happen to be at a lower elevation angle. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, you know, this is rather related. Um, 
We did have a question come in from George Silvis, who's curious about doing spectroscopy with a remote telescope so that you don't have to be in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, is it possible to set up a spectroscopic rig which can be fully automated or at least made remote so that you don't have to be there at the telescope fiddling with things? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's trickier than remote use of photometry uh, because it adds a few problems. You know, you zoom, move your telescope to your target, standard for photometry, get focused, all that. Uh, but now you have to place your target exactly on the slit uh, and and then get the spectrograph and the calibration lamp and all that working. But yeah, um, it's trickier. It's a little more complicated, but I know two or three people uh, who are doing it, uh, you know, from scopes in Chile while they're in their backyards in Michigan. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, it can be done. Excellent. That's great news. Okay, thank you. I know I've heard before that um, AAVSONET has been working on adding spectroscopic capabilities to their network. They have already star analyzer gratings, which are available for remote use by AAVSO members, but I know they've also been working on getting some slit spectrographs up and running. It is more difficult, as you say, but it's good to hear that it is doable. <laughs> okay. Um, Next question here, this one comes from Anton Gregory. Do you have any comments regarding the Astronomical League's spectroscopy observing program? I can speak to that because I happen to be working on that right now. <clears throat> I don't know, Bob, if you've ever done it, but um, no. uh, yeah, so the there is a, it's one of the few AL programs that has a prerequisite. Um, you have to complete the stellar evolution observing program for that. Then you can make your segue into the spectroscopy observing section. Um, <clears throat> I completed the, I hope nobody that would get upset is listening, but I completed the um, stellar evolution observing program and found, found that it contains some, I think, major dis dis deficiencies, which I then corrected. One of the deficiencies was it had a um, like one third of the objects was 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 in a group called colorful stars, which I had a hard time relating that to stellar evolution. And the other one was it kind of completely ignored southern hemisphere observers. So I rewrote the observing list for that. That's currently under review. So maybe in time when people have to take that um, stellar evolution program as a prerequisite for spectroscopy, it'll be in better shape. Okay, now spectroscopy one. I'm only part way through it. But um, it is, if you want to learn not just how to do spectroscopy, but how to um, properly uh, calibrate and um, in atmosphere instrument response your spectra, that's a great way, it's, it's a great motivator to do that. And in addition, um, you, you have to observe like three stars in e of each of the spectral classes and then identify main spectral features. So that for me went meant uh, referencing Walker's spectral atlas, going out to the NIST spectral data spectral database and generating um, spectral profiles there. And you know, walking through and, and really like, okay, here's here, you know, here's the kind of uh, features you can see in a B type star, right? Based on its temperature and um, it's it's a great it's a great program. I mean, I don't care about the pin and the certificate. I just think it it's a great way to if you're starting out in spectroscopy, it organizes, it has it provides an organized approach to learning that I, I fully support. That's great to hear. Thank you. Okay. Um next we have a question from Brian Davis who is curious about uh, the resources SIMBAD and VSX when you're looking for information either on a variable star uh, that you want to observe as a target or as a standard star, how reliable and accurate are each of those databases? Which should you be using to pick out your standard stars or your targets? So by standard star, does he mean the reference star? Yes, and that's probably my terminology mix up again. 
Okay, I don't think you should be going to Sinbad to pick out reference stars to do your atmospheric instrumental response correction. I use the Miles database, which has, I don't know, I don't remember how many, but a large number of known calibrated stars for that purpose. Yeah, included in ISIS. Um, Brian's written question uh, talked about the reliability and accuracy of the variable star information in Simbad versus VSX. Um, uh, I was at three different venues in the past year where somebody pointed out that if you look at Simbad, for example, uh, but or any other uh, database and say, give me a list of all of the RR Lyra stars, you'll get a list. And something around 20% of those are not actually RR Lyra's. They've been misclassified. Uh, my suspicion is the same is true of a lot of the classifications. Um, that's one of the reasons that um, uh, there was a, a uh, a, uh, a type of observation that was identified at that AAS workshop last summer called routine but necessary replications to go look at all those RR Lyras and confirm that in fact they are <laughs> because some of them just flat aren't and if you're if you're a researcher who's studying RR Lyras you need to know that some of those in the in the catalogs have been misidentified and get the catalog properly identified. Um, you know, it's like anything else, the the combination of human and uh, automatic pipeline classifications sometimes gets it wrong. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, um, getting down to the last couple of questions here. There's one theme which I've seen show up a bunch of different times, and that's related to the different uh, configurations of the focal plane, depending on what type of instrument you're using. So we've had people asking about, you know, where should the focal plane be if you're using a slit spectrograph? What if you're using slitless? And we even had a comment come in that was about uh, objective grading spectroscopy, which is maybe worth a mention. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit, you know, for a total beginner, how should you be finding your best focus? What's the correct configuration for various options? So for slitless, you want to focus not on the zero order star image, but on a prominent spectral line. And <clears throat> you want to adjust the focus so the depth of that spectral line is as deep as, you know, is deepest. And there's actually a way within the R spec software to do that kind of real time. And a, a slit spectrograph uh, has either two or three focal planes that you need to deal with. Um, in fact, let's see, where's that diagram of mine? Share screen. Um, that, oops. Where is it? That diagram. Your telescope should be focusing the star onto the slit and your spectrograph is then focusing that slit onto your science camera. So that's two separate focal planes that both have to be properly focused. Setting the camera correctly is usually a kind of do it once on the bench and, and you never need to touch it again some mostly and then you probably also have a guiding camera out here and that's the third focal plane that you have to get focused um i hope that helps i think it does thank you okay um taking a look at the questions we have remaining so there were a couple of questions that we got about software, specifically if you have any specific software suggestions to make. And uh, also we did have a request for resources for learning um, the software ISIS that a number of people use, if you can point anyone to any tips there. So that's kind of a two-parter. Um. I, I use ISIS and uh, and I like it a lot. It's uh, 
flexible and uh, has more features than you will find in the descriptions of what it can do. Uh, and it's one great drawback is there is no user manual. There are a whole lot of uh, single topic uh, uh, web pages on Christian Buell's website um, that have been translated from French into English pretty darn well. And you, you're not going to read them and understand it, but if you read them and then follow along and do it to your own spectrum, uh, it, it will become pretty clear. Um, I know people who like bass better. Um, mm. You know, it's like, you know, do you like Windows or Apple better, I think. Uh, V-Spec, uh, a lot of people use and like. Uh, R-Spec uh, is great, uh, with albeit some limitations when you get into the um, uh, Shellyac spectrographs that have their own unique features. Um, Another one, uh, Bob, would be uh, Shellyak's Demetra. At least yeah. that's how that that's how Francois pronounces it. So that's how I pronounce it. Um, the nice thing about so the nice thing about Demetra is um, it's it's a freeware provided by Shellyak. It's tailored for the LP six hundred and I think one other. I can't remember which one, but I uh, use it for my. There is a Uvex. Yeah, a Uvex. Yes. Well, I use it for my LP six hundred, and what I like about it is. It is a combine. It's the it's a piece of software that combines the image acquisition, the spectral acquisition, with the spectral processing. You know, in like Bass Project, you that's an analysis side of it. You still have to acquire your spectra via some other means. Um, with Demetra, <clears throat> again, it does both the acquisition and the processing, and it's kind of set up as a like um, hard to fail because it's a uh, it has the basically sequence of process steps and you, it has a, you know, red green. So in order to move from the first process step to the next, if it's, if your previous one's red, you, you're not going to move on. So you got to fix what's wrong and then move on to the next green one, the next green one, next green and so on. And uh, when you're all done, you'll have a, a, a well calibrated um, 1D profile. Yeah, that's one thing I, I know that uh, they designed into uh, Demetra and I like a lot is it forces you uh, to use uh, a, a sequence of steps. You know, got a calibration lamp, got a reference star, got a target spectrum, and you can't, you can't go be to the next step unless you've done that. Uh, and I love that. Um, I, I would agree that our spec is, is great software for the sledless guys. And gals, um, and uh, I think I think it makes a good pairing uh, for slotless. Um, I I I use uh, Demetra as I mentioned, and I've all, I also use Bass Project. Um, and Bob, I think it's probably probably just because I started with that, started learning it. And I was like, well, it kind of does everything I need to. So why, you know, why shop somewhere else? Yeah. So yeah, and our spec is great for displaying spectra too regardless of how you got them. That's true. The presentation mode is nice. So, but all of these software packages um, are um, doing complex things with your data. Uh, and as a result, they're, you, know, you have to make an investment in, um, in learning uh, their way of thinking and what they do and what they expect from you in order to become comfortable and proficient with them. There's, there's, there's no getting around that. I noticed somebody asked about R or Python. Mm -hmm. um, I have only played a little bit with uh, Python AstroPy analysis of spectra. Um, and it's, you know, if you're a Python person, it's wonderful. If you're not, it's really confusing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Once you learn it, it is, you know, it's delightful to be able to write your own stuff, but you might find yourself spending more time writing code than you are doing spectroscopy. Okay. And remember, this webinar is about introduction to spectroscopy. That's a very good point, Scott. <laughs> Thank you for keeping us on track. Okay. Um, speaking of, we had a question which is more relevant to beginners. So when you're starting out with a typical um, entry-level one-shot color camera, 
you may have the option to save your images in a mono 8 grayscale mode or to take the original RGB images and then convert them to grayscale in software. Does it matter which one you do? I, Lauren, you've got more experience yeah. than I. I. I'm shaking my head. I, I have no idea. OK. Unfortunately, I think that means we just need to move on to another question, because my experience was with a 20-year-old DSLR. So and that, did not have so, a mono eight mode. So that is a very resounding, we don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. Um, Sorry about that to the person who asked that question. Maybe you can go visit the spectroscopy forum and ask there, and you may find some other people in the AAVSO who do have experience and can help you. OK, just a couple more questions left. This one comes from Timothy Weaver, who's curious about whether you can use a slitless grading to measure velocity shifts, such as redshift in galaxies. Uh, well, I demonstrated. Do, yeah, I don't know, because my, my example was using the LP on, on 3C273, so I don't have any experience with going slitless and trying to do that. Yeah, um, well, I, I measured um, 3C273 with a um, SA100 and a C11, uh, and it was shockingly simple to do. Uh, the trick is it is a star-like point of light with a huge redshift. Um, if the galaxy has any observable angular subtents, then you know it's going to reduce your resolution and make life difficult. I, I pick a galaxy that has a prominent H2 region in it, which is probably near a point source, might very well be able to. Yeah, I just, I was just brought up and was perusing uh, Tom Fields' uh, rspecastro.com website on sample projects and detect emission lines and nebula, spec supergiant, star temperature. Um, ah, detect the redshift of a quasar. He doesn't say measure necessarily, but he does have, um, yeah, well, actually he's he's got an example there. So I think based on what Tom Field has, in his uh, done with his uh, R spec software, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Okay, now um, I think there's really only one question left, and I saw it pop up a bunch of times. And fortunately, it's one that I can help answer. That was specifically about since this was such a great presentation. Uh, can we access it later and review it? And the answer is yes. We have been recording this webinar, and it will be posted to our YouTube channel very shortly. It's also going to be automatically posted to Facebook just as soon as we wrap up here. So you can find it in either of those locations and review all of this fantastic information from Bob and Scott. And I believe that that was the last of the unanswered questions from our queue. So let me go ahead and get up our closing slides. Man, we're like right at the one hour mark too. We timed it perfectly. Hey, thank, thank you all for sticking with us. This has been yeah. fun and interesting. It, it really has been. Okay, there we go. All right. I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to both Bob and Scott for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. This has really been an extremely informative webinar, a huge success. Thank you both. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> now get out there and take Spectra. Here, here. And then submit them to AV spec so that I can see them. <laughs> After you have verified your procedures and done your quality check, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for being the responsible one in the room, Scott. Okay. Um, I would also like to thank again this webinar sponsor, RSpec Astro. They will be happy to hear from you with any questions that you might have about getting into spectroscopy. As a reminder, you can reach them using their website's contact form. And I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our 2024 series sponsor, Voice Astro. The Voice Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. 
Now, as a reminder, registration has opened for next month's free webinar. This one is scheduled for April 13th, and we're expecting to have a real fun time with Professor Paula Scotti exploring all of the different classes of cataclysmic variables. You can learn more about the webinar and also find the registration link by visiting our website at aavso.org slash webinars. I hope to see you there. Now, let me just say thank you. Yeah, I mean you. Everyone who's out there in the audience and who watched, listened, and participated in today's webinar. It's your participation in all of our programs which allows us to keep growing, keep educating, and keep making an impact on variable star science. So thank you. We are so grateful for your support. As I was saying earlier, today's broadcast has been recorded. So if you'd like to go back and reference some of these wonderful spectroscopic details, or maybe just review the beginner part of the presentation, you can find the recording on our Facebook page where it will be automatically uploaded just as soon as the webinar ends. Pretty soon, I'll also upload it to our YouTube channel, where it will join an enormous library of educational videos, including several past sessions on spectroscopy. You can find our library on YouTube by searching for the username AAVSOHQ. When you log out of the webinar, you should not automatically be shown a survey. I would really appreciate it if you could fill out the survey, let us know what you thought of today's session, and what we might be able to do better next time. I really value your feedback. To close, I would like to express one last huge thank you to Scott Donnell and Bob Buckheim from all of us here at the AAVSO. We appreciate you and everything that you do. Well, thank you, Lauren. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my hope is that we've inspired some people to get out there and get involved in amateur spectroscopy. And uh, the basic message I think they've heard from both Bob and I is the cost of entry is not that high and there's a lot you can do. So no reason not to get going. Absolutely. And, and as uh, my friends at Shelliac would say, the stars will never look the same. That's so true. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See you all next time. Bye. All right. Scott,